Alright, uh, good afternoon. Uh, looks like we're saving the best for last. Always uh, appreciate to, to see uh, uh, folks uh, you know, hanging out for the last session. I appreciate that. Um, <coughs> Uh, appreciate the introduction as well. Whenever I hear that, I always wonder, gee, can I hold a job or anything? Um, uh, so I'm Craig Prong. I'm Professor of Finance at the uh, Institute at the University of Houston. Um, and uh, uh, I uh, uh, do a lot of, uh, of research on uh, economics and, uh, associated with commodity markets and energy trading in particular. I uh, wrote a white paper in um, 2014 about the economics of commodity trading firms and uh, uh, you know, sort of based on that I've been uh, in subsequent years been looking at uh, uh, applications of technology including blockchain uh, to the energy industry. And so that's why I'm very uh, interested and in looking forward to uh, this panel discussion today because it's going to touch on those issues. Um, <clears throat> uh, what I'll do first is I will uh, introduce our speakers. Um, and then I'll turn to them and let them uh, give uh, a few introductory remarks and then we'll turn to some questions. Uh, our first uh, panelist is uh, Deanna Reitman, who's a Corporate and Securities Counsel for DLA Piper, a law firm. Uh, she's here in Houston. Uh, we have uh, Mark Courtney, who's Managing Director of Entoro Capital, LLC. Uh, in part, uh, and finally, uh, Shirin Vakil, uh, who's a senior manager at Deloitte and Touche uh, LLP. Um, so, uh, with uh, those introductions out of the way, uh, why don't I uh, uh, turn to our panelists and uh, uh, we'll just go, I guess, uh, left to, to right here, starting with uh, 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 Shirin and uh, to sort of give your sort of overview of, uh, of blockchain and how it uh, uh, relates to and can be applied to and may affect uh, the energy trading business. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, I started looking at blockchain uh, just out of curiosity a couple of years ago to see, okay, whether or not this even has the potential or is it just a bunch of different, and, or is it just a bunch of hype? And as having spent 14 years in the energy trading industry and understanding the activities that happen all the way from front office to middle office to, to back, it was evident that just given the nature of the industry across the value chain, and it, it, it is a supply network in more than one way. So when you, when you have so many different intermediaries, um, there's, there's not enough trust. And then you look at all the characteristics that make it conducive for, for blockchain to be applied. There's several use cases out there. And I think we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg with the, the use cases that we've all heard about. Um, yeah. Hello again. So I had spoken earlier. For those of you who weren't here, I am an energy marketing and trading um, lawyer. I'm also an energy finance lawyer. And so I had given remarks earlier, about 25 minutes of remarks that I'm sure you're all were bored with, about how I believe blockchain can be used in the energy commodity life cycle. And I worked through with you um, an example with the natural gas transaction. So I do believe, although I don't know how, because I'm not a technology person, that there will be some efficiencies, some effectiveness, and some uh, reduction in error, some, re uh, some redundancy reduction with the use of blockchain in the energy, commodity, marketing, and trading life cycle. Um, and that's from in, my, from, in my perspective, from beginning to end, which includes supply chain. So, um, you know, as a lawyer, I'm not, really, I'm not really sure how it would be done. Like, I don't really know how to code, but I know it can be done. I know that, um, and I said this earlier, that I'm probably talking myself out of a job because there is an aspect to all this um, which is contractual. Um, but it will come. When it will come, I don't know. But I just wanted to make sure that I'm part of that conversation when it does happen. Um, hi. Happy to be here. My name is Mark Courtney. Um, I am doing something really old, something I've done uh, off and on for the past 30 years, but uh, also something with a really new twist. Uh, it's classic investment banking, energy finance. Uh, but what we've seen is some changes uh, happen and I believe happening very rapidly right now uh, as we incorporate the blockchain into this kind of old, you know, white shoe um, Wall Street industry. Um, what we've seen is 
a lot of deals get done sort of outside the system in the last few years. I think there was something like $17 billion of ICOs went out last year. Uh, those aren't all utility tokens. And uh, according to the SEC, uh, in some remarks last fall, in his view, none of them were, were utility tokens. All of them were securities. So we are trying to do a securitized token offerings uh, and kind of toe the line with the SEC, bring them inside the fold and stay in the middle of the fairway. Um, but the reason for doing that has a lot to do with blockchain and smart contracts. There is a logistics problem even when you're just raising money for, um, for uh, say, a, a drilling program in Canada, which is one that I'm doing. Um, once that money's in the door, those tokens act a little bit like shares of stock, but the blockchain and smart contracts allow us to track ownership of those, to track distributions, for it to all be out there on the blockchain so that it's easy to see, easy to follow. Uh, so it introduces a lot of efficiencies, cuts out some of the people, a little bit like Dan just said, and maybe working myself out of a job a little bit. I hope really what I'm doing is working some of the Wall Street white you guys out of a job because uh, we're going to be doing it faster and, and cheaper with fewer personnel uh, than it's been done in the past because of our use of the blockchain. That uh, introduction, folks. Um, now I'll uh, uh, you know, turn to some uh, more specific questions. Uh, um, uh, Shuren, uh, so uh, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, level of interest that your clients have in blockchain? Sure. Um, so, I, so the conversations that I've had have focused in the energy trading space, whether it be it uh, actually broader than energy trading, commodities trading. Mm -hmm. So whether it's agricultural trading companies, power and utility trading companies or oil and gas trading companies. And the interest is, is it, it's all along the spectrum. Um, most of the folks, the conversation start off with a blockchain 101 discussion. They want to know, they've heard about blockchain. They want to understand what blockchain is and how it can apply to their organization. Um, next, it gets into a proof of concept. People are, most of the companies are interested in exploring what blockchain is, because mm -hmm. after those conversations, if they start getting interested or curious about it, proof of concept is, is the cheapest or the lowest risk way of uh, playing around with a new technology, so to speak. And then some on the other en end of the spectrum that have uh, taken the initiative to start a consortium uh, are leading the way, and they want to understand, OK, what does that consortium need to look like from an operating model standpoint? How do we, uh, what's the strategy? How do we onboard, offboard members? What, what are the, some of the legal and uh, regulatory and compliance considerations they need to make? And not just from legal, re regulatory and compliance, but from a broader risk management framework standpoint. And then of course, invariably, uh, conversations come up around cyber, cyber security or privacy. What happens? Who owns the data? Uh, had a client that has presence in, the, in, in Europe and now with GDPR, they're starting to get concerned what happens to entities, individuals owning the right to delete the data. So all along the spectrum, Craig. Well, and you mentioned use cases in your introductory remarks. What are some of the basic use cases that people are focusing on? So the most common uh, use case uh, that comes up invariably is around uh, trading reconciliations and settlements. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine the life cycle of a trade, it gets reconciled a million times, a million times, but a few dozen times over the life of the trade. Uh, I helped one of the clients build a proof of concept using settlements uh, and use that as an example. They execute about 150,000 trades a year. On an average, every trade gets touched 14 different times, either between front, mid, mid and back, and then sometimes with the counterparty, and they might have ICE confirm involved or paper confirms involved or whatever the case might be. So they wanted to see, okay, how can blockchain help? So we built a proof of concept, 10, 10 week exercise, uh, and at the end of the proof of concept, the business case was, you can eliminate all the points of reconciliation except one, for it to get recorded onto the onto the nodes, so your FTE time uh, goes from 7,500 hours annually to about 2,500 hours. So that's you in today's organizations where we run everybody's running such a lean shop. Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity to redeploy these resources from back office to something more value add or analytical driven. Yeah, cool. All right, thanks, um, Deanna. Now, first, after Mark, is it you, know, you talked about 
you know, working yourself out of a job, I, you know, lawyers always seem to find ways to, <laughs> you know, survive. So, so, uh, but uh, can you uh, just uh, yeah, tell us uh, uh, sort of a yin and yang question here? You know, what are some of the the the, the knotty legal issues uh, that blockchain might uh, pose to energy or commodity traders generally? And what are some of the legal problems that blockchain may be able to permit these kinds of firms uh, to, uh, uh, to, to address? Sure. So um, the energy commodity business essentially has three main regulators, OK? The CFTC, um, the FTC, and the FERC. So the CFTC is the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, and they have jurisdiction over every commodity traded in the United States. And it starts with, if you are going to buy and sell a commodity, including agricultural commodities, you need to do, and you want to have future delivery, you need to do so on a board of trade. Okay, that's the bottom line. You cannot, um, and they do that because they want to make, because these things are very important to us to live, right? Like, well, we need corn, we kind of need, you know, cotton. These are things that are very important, so they regulate it very, very heavily. There are exceptions to that. And one of the exceptions to that before 2010 was energy commodities were exempt. They were called actually exempt commodities. That was the defined term. And so you could trade energy commodities between me and you if you were considered a large enough counterparty with a large enough base to make sure that you're paying the bills, you're actually making the deliveries. Because it takes a lot of money to buy a barrel of crude and deliver it, and make sure you can pay on it. Um, after Dodd-Frank, that was all gone away. But there was still this robust over-the-counter market. And what I mean by over-the-counter is you don't actually trade through an exchange. So over-the-counter means I trade with you, you trade with me, but we have enough trust in each other's credit that um, we can do that. It was called, an, you, were, you were called something called an eligible contract participant. That essentially just means you're a big boy. Like you can make your own decisions. Um, that kind of went away, but yet this robust over-the-counter market still existed. And so it kind of changed focus, and it changed focus to a swap. So now all you hear with Dodd-Frank is regulation of swap, regulation of swap, regulation of swap. So if you're a big boy, you can still trade a swap, which is essentially you know, you're, swapping, you're, you know, you're swapping the financial payments with the underlying commodity. Um, but you still have to be that big boy. So what I believe is that you can use a blockchain environment or a, uh, a closed blockchain environment where the only people that are allowed in there are the big boys, are the ECPs. And you can ensure that you are mitigating credit risk because um, everybody already meets the requirement. Now, but it's so heavily regulated that if you're going to do this, you need to report back to the CTC almost everything you do. And you have to report that you're not, over, you know, that you're not um, trading so much that you're going to take down the, financial, the, the finances of the United States. So if you have a blockchain, you don't actually have to report to the government. They can maybe be, become a part of this blockchain and see what transactions are happening and the value of them within these blockchains. And it can cut down on mistakes in the reporting. You create efficiency because nobody has to run the report and check the report. And that is one of the ways that regulatory um, environment is good for blockchain with the CFTC. Now, the regulatory environment with the FERC, now the FERC has jurisdiction over natural gas traded in this country, right? So now, one of the great things I can think about is how blockchain can help there is the FERC has this rule, and it gets everybody in, in trouble, and it's called shipper must have title. And it is exactly what it sounds like. OK, so if you are going to have title to gas, and you want to ship it from point A to point B on a pipeline, you must have title. you got to have title. Like, I can't turn to you and say, can you please ship my gas for me because you own the space on the pipeline. I can't do it. Shipper must have title. And the reason why they do that is because they want to make sure that, you know, because all that capacity in the pipeline is actually has value. They want to make sure that the person that is um, buying the capacity is buying it for the right price. So if the shipper must have title, if I'm not going to use it, I can't hoard it, I have to sell it. You know, we're going to make sure that it always has you know, there's the right value along with that capacity, so shipper must have title. So one of the great ways that blockchain can help there is that you can tell, because you already know that the shipper must have title, and it can automatically feed the um, pipeline bulletin boards. Like a lot of people get in trouble because you go onto the pipeline bulletin board, and the pipeline bulletin board says, okay, Dina Reitman owns this capacity. And 
I'm moving gas on it, but you can't check. Right? There's no way to check because it's just somebody keying it in. So if it automatically feeds that, you will know. Dina Reitman has capacity. Dina Reitman has the gas. It will be able to create efficiencies and effectiveness. We'll be able to probably, even from that regard, see what capacity is not being used and what is being used. And then perhaps even within your, your blockchain environment, you can begin to trade the capacity. So all the value there. So it's another wonderful thing that legal and regulatory can do um, that can be made even better for commercial with the use of blockchain, but within the legal environment today. And that's the second regulator. Now, the third regulator involved in this space is the FTC. They're not really involved very, very heavily. But they do have a market manipulation rule over the trading of petroleum products in this country. So you cannot uh, manipulate the price of petroleum products in this country, meaning you must um, have a legitimate business reason for the reason why you're selling something, the price you're selling it, and the other person has to have a legitimate reason as to why they're buying it. You can't hoard you know, petroleum products in, in storage and not release it into the market if there's no reason for that, just to drive the price up. You can't you know, put a bunch of bids out into market when you really don't have anything to, to, to buy just to drive the price up. That would be market manipulation. So another way that blockchain can help here, which is a great you know, uh, legal benefit of the blockchain technology mixed with, with the regulatory legal environment, is that in the blockchain, you're not going to be able to manipulate the price because you would set up your environment where the prices would, could be executed at market price. And once they're executed at market price, that is market price. And you cannot go in and change it because it, the, the transaction is wrapped in an algorithm that locks it in and is then chained to the transaction next to it, and you can't change it. If you try to go in and change that transaction, you, you, you can't. Everybody in the environment will be aware. So we will then also have, perhaps, with the use of this technology, a reduction in a market manipulation. And I did mention the FTC, but you know, the CFTC and the FERC both have market manipulation rules as long, and they also have disruptive trading practices rules and things like that, which could possibly be eliminated as risks if you're in a blockchain environment where the mathematics locks down the transaction. You and I already know what we're buying and selling it for, and no one can, can change it or change the quantity or withhold the quantity. Um, and so those are, that's a long answer to how the legal environment can uh, be benefit sure. here. Uh, uh, you know, a couple of remarks. I mean, you mentioned you know, basically you know, swaps reporting. And so the swaps uh, data repositories was a part of the mandate of, of Dodd-Frank, Frank and Dodd, as I've come to call it. Um, and that's one of the things that has not worked very well. It's been sort of a nightmare. So it's like the black hole, all this data goes in, and then you know, nobody can do anything with it. So. If I may, we were in a conversation with the CFTC where we had them in our lab yeah. because they wanted to explore what blockchain is. And that was their realization that we don't need three or four different SDRs because right. data consum ingestion and right. For them, the whole mandate was real-time visibility, right. Right. which they still don't have. Right. So they, they, if they could, they would set up their own SDR, but right. their legal challenges yeah. Are, yeah. Yeah. give them that. Yeah. And so that uh, when the SDRs came back, came out, I, yeah, I know that the idea was to have competing SDRs, and I always thought that that was just bizarre, bizarre and moronic, and it would <laughs> never work. And it's good now that they're finally figuring that out. Uh, <laughs> although, and another thing, Deanna, though, is that. Um, um, uh, you know, in some respects, the mechanical nature of the automatic nature of some of the things in blockchain can actually create manipulation opportunities. Uh, so you talk about if something is tied to the market price, uh, you know, where's that market price determined? If that's determined off the blockchain and I can engage in transactions that move that market price. Then you can't, that, though. That would be illegal. Yeah. And illegal <laughs> things never happen. <laughs> never. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> you cannot do it. All right. Yeah. So. Yeah. So. Uh, leave that pass for now. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mark, I, I'm intrigued about u utility tokens. Can you sort of walk through a particular example of how utility tokens can work in in your world? Uh, sure. Uh, and, and and there's a good example that actually one of the SEC guys used to kind of define the difference between the security token and utility tokens. Um, Let's say there's a, a cab company, and the cab company wants to increase their ridership. They're getting hurt by Uber or whatever. Uh, so they issue utility tokens. Each token is good for a cab ride. Uh, if their average cab ride is $10, they might issue these tokens and sell them for $5 and say each token is good for a ride. So if you wanted to, you could go in and buy a bunch of tokens if you're a big cab guy. 
you buy a bunch of tokens and you basically have a bunch of half price cab rides. Uh, essentially what they're doing is pre-selling rides at a discount in order to increase ridership, you know, it could be an advertising deal that they're, you know, for whatever reason. Uh, but the reason is not to raise money. The reason is to promote ridership and, and PR and that sort of thing. And you're getting a good deal because you're pre-buying them. Um, that is a utility token. That token has utility. It has usefulness. Not in a financial, you know, way. Usefulness in a way that get, gets you from point A to B in a cab. Now, let's take that exact same scenario, but say the cab company doesn't exist yet. And the, the, the owner or p potential owner issues these tokens out to you guys. Same deal. Your average cab ride is going to cost $10. I'm going to sell a bunch of tokens for $5. I'm going to take that money and I'm going to buy a bunch of cabs and create a cab company. Now, from your standpoint, it, work, it looks the same, right? You, get a, you got a token that entitles you to a cab ride and you paid $5 for it and it only cost you 10 From the point of view of the company, though, the issuer, it's very different. He used your money. He used those tokens as a way to raise funds to create a company. He funded his company through that. That is a security token. Um, and it's, it, sometimes the line can be as fine as that. It's the same token to you guys, but to the cab guy, the guy that owns a company, he created a company versus advertised a service that he already had. So there's a financial aspect to those tokens. Um, another, uh, another example they used was, let's say you're a college student and you got washers and dryers in the basement of your dorm and they work on tokens. So you buy a bunch of tokens, enough for your semester there. And you use those for your semester there. Those are utility tokens. You just get to wash your clothes with them. Let's say, though, that you buy two years worth because you think that the cost of that's going to go up next year. And you plan to sell that extra bunch to the guy who's taking your room for next year. That's a security. Because you are expecting some financial benefit from that. Now, those are really strange lines to draw, maybe. And it, in those. In those uh, examples, they sound clear, although fine, but that's the kind of way the SEC is looking at it right now. So there's still a lot to shake out in there, I believe. But what I do believe is to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And to a regulator, everything needs regulated. So I'm not at all surprised that the head of the SEC last fall said, you know what, every token I've seen look like a security. So Your hammer looks what like are some nail. particular use cases in energy for a utility token? Um, in, in energy, um, what we're doing with them, and, and these are very clearly securities tokens, is we're, like I said before, doing things like funding drilling programs. Um, you know, a company has uh, some wells, several wells. Um, we're in a situation now in the energy industry where, you know, it went, it, you know, prices were down in 16. Most smaller companies, um, you know, started running low on cash about now. Now prices are up. Suddenly it makes sense to take these wells that you've got and do workovers, and, and, you know, improve the output from those wells. Costs money to do that. Nobody has that money right now because the prices two years ago were pretty bad. So even though today it makes perfect ep economic sense, it's a no-brainer. Put some money in that well, rework it, Bump your output from 100 barrels a day to 500 barrels a day. It's a no-brainer to do. The science is there. You know it's going to happen if you put that money in, but they don't have the money. So they are going out to raise the money to do that. But you're talking about small you know, oil and gas companies. They need $50 million to do that. Well, the, the equity funds don't really want to look at anything less than $100 million or so. The, the large bankers and all don't want to look at anything less than 100 or 500 million for an offering. It's just not worth their time. And when I say that, it's because they need a lot of time to do it. They got to put a lot of people on it. It's an expensive process. And it's a time consuming process to do a traditional offering. So you have this, I call it kind of like if you're a fisherman, it's the slot limit in deals. Uh, if you need Two million for your company, you know, you probably got enough friends and families or people that know people that know you that you can go get that. If you need 
15 or 20 million for your company, you kind of got a problem because none of the fundraise, none of the money raisers are going to work with these too small. And you know, some of you might. I don't have friends that have 25 million dollars. Um, so you got this lot limit. Well, you can address that with the blockchain and stuff because of what I said earlier. With smart contracts, with the blockchain, you decrease the, the time and effort and money it costs to do that deal. You also dramatically decrease your post-deal cost. Because think about this, once you start a partnership, or you gotta track all those guys, you gotta know where they are, because you gotta send them checks every quarter. Uh, you got to you got to figure out how the tax. You got to know all of their individual tax situation, what country they're in. If they're in a country that doesn't have a tax treaty with the U.S., and you got to withhold 30 uh, percent withholding automatically. If they're in a country with a tax treaty, you got to see what that tax treaty is and withhold that amount. If it's the U.K., it's 15 percent, unless the company may be traded on the Irish exchange, et cetera, et cetera. It gets complicated fast, and if you're a little guy, that's hard to do. It's, cost, it's costly and time consuming. Blockchain can do all that. A smart contract knows where those people are. Uh, and it tracks them and the money goes to them. And, and as long as they keep up with, you know, with, as long as, you know, if one of them moves from the UK to, to Malta, then maybe his tax thing changes. Blockchain knows he's over there now because he updates it that way. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> Now, a lot of the uh, applications that uh, have gotten publicity in blockchain have been uh, sort of within a particular company. So, you know, Maersk and Shipping or Cargill and Turkey's, uh, you know, Walmart for va uh, managing its chain. Um, but, uh, Sharon, you, you mentioned about, uh, you know, essentially consortia. And uh, most trading applications, it takes two to trade, right? You need a lot of people. And, and uh, uh, so, um, what are some of the challenges associated with creating a consortium, and how do you think that those challenges are going to affect um, uh, the timeline for making these consortia actually uh, come to uh, fruition? Yeah, um, really good questions because I think everybody kind of grapples with that. Um, so the biggest, the biggest questions that we hear are <clears throat> from a contractual perspective. How do we set up this organization? Where is it going to be? It's incorporated, so to speak, right? And then you come up with your technology platform to use. Uh, questions that they have is, do we go with Ethereum? Do we go with, in case of EWF, Tabaloba, or whatever the technology stack you want to use? What's the longevity of that? So the, those, it starts with that. And then dip, then it comes quickly to, OK, what is the problem that we're, gonna, we're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. uh, and how do we make sure that that's a problem that's common across the industry that we can recruit the, uh, the companies to create the critical mass. Because I, And then it's a chicken or the egg thing. Do you create the critical mass first, or do you create the solution and then hope uh, people will come to whatever you build? Build the dream solution. Build it, and they'll come. Come, right? <laughs> but it's a risky proposition, too, right? Because there's so many competing uh, solutions that are, um, that are being built. And then it gets into a bunch of legal and regulatory yeah. questions. OK, who owns the data? What happens to the data when they leave, so to speak? Uh, sometimes, Because that's happened a lot in the FSI space with R3, the JP Morgan Consortium. Um, there are antitrust. Antitrust. There are rules. antitrust matters right. right from the very, very beginning. Yeah. There is yeah. proprietary information and confidential information mm -hmm. sharing problems. Yeah. And then there's all this use case and how do you prioritize them to make sure that everybody's best interests are being, ma uh, being met. Um, it's, so it's, 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 it's a laundry list of things that the companies are trying to uh, figure out. And then, if there are, th then the next question becomes, um, if there's a consortium out there or there's two consortiums that are solving the same problem, who do we go with? <laughs> And, and that raises an interesting question. Also, I'm going to uh, toss this to you in a second, Deanna, because I think the antitrust aspects are going to be very important from the following perspective, is that you know, so basically the, the utility of a, of a consortium blockchain like this, uh, which is going to be a many-to-many -many kind of platform, is you know, there's going to be, just like an exchange, there are going to be network effects. It's, you know, everybody's going to want to typically gravitate towards one platform it's likely to be that one platform is going to survive, and then you have issues of organization, governance, control, and antitrust. And you, you want to touch on any of those issues? Uh, yeah, sure. Know? So um, for the most part in this country, 
competitors are not allowed to share their business sensitive information um, in order to carve up the market, create a price that doesn't really exist based on supply and demand, or um, with, you know, withhold someone from getting into the market because they want to keep the whole market for themselves. There's three main laws here in this country, but that's essentially it. There are some exceptions to those, and one of the exceptions, because you're probably all thinking in your head right now, that I know that there's joint ventures all over the place, especially in the energy space, um, and there are some exceptions, and the exceptions to those are if you are entering into a legitimate partnership with a competitor, and you are sharing information for the benefit of the partnership, but even then, there is some, you have to really be sure that you're sharing uh, information for the benefit of the partnership, and it gets kind of tricky. Um, but this isn't a partnership. What is it? You know, it's, it's, you're not in a formal agreement with any one person necessarily in the consortium. You may meet the criteria to, to, to enter in the consortium, but maybe you do need to be in a formal agreement. I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But you, there are the antitrust, um, there are the antitrust problems on the front end, and then there's antitrust problems as it goes on because if I am buying a large amount of crude and I'm taking it off the market, um, <coughs> should somebody else know that that's happening right away? I, I don't know. Does that give my competitor information that they wouldn't automatically have until it is absorbed by the market that there's less supply out there? That, again, is an antitrust problem, uh, but it's happening in real time. I don't know how you get around that stuff. And then there is, at the back end, um, <coughs> like, like you were saying, who does that information belong to? A lot of times, when you know it's your information, you have a remedy. So if I have that information and it belongs to me, and it's my entity's information, I can sue you if you steal it. But who does it belong to? And I can't sue you anymore. I no longer <coughs> have a remedy. There's no more, like, stick anymore. There's no reason to enter into a conf confidentiality agreement because what are you going to do? Sue me? You can't. I, I see it every day. It's not really confidential. So it's hard. It's hard to figure this stuff out. Well, and that also brings up another issue in that, you know, one of the keys of any kind of trading, energy and commodity trading, as an example of that, is it's all about having an information edge um, and exploiting an information edge. And uh, does that create tensions in uh, sort of an industry-wide or a consortium type of uh, endeavor because uh, you know, people don't want to have information like, hey, I bought this cargo or I sold this cargo disclosed. Is that an issue that you That's going to be one of the first questions that come up, right? right? So if, if Deanne and I do a trade, there's no reason for anybody else to know that, which is fine from, from a technology standpoint. There's limited visibility because you're trying to solve a math problem. But at the same time, the data is still being recorded. And you know, so it's, that, that's a big part of the concern right, right. now. No, you're right. The arbitrage opportunities based around the, the information will perhaps decrease. But that doesn't mean that there's not going to be other arbitrage or other business right. opportunities. You could probably, you know, if we can, you know, I was talking to somebody earlier, I think it was somebody over there. If we could figure out how to get payments faster, we could finance more. We can raise more money. We can get more capital. We can reduce the amount of money it takes to trade. We could trade more. So yes, I think that the market will change. It will have to evolve because the arbitrage opportunities will be different. The money making opportunities will be probably around the money movement, maybe. Maybe? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Okay. Completely. Well, and, and Mark, but that raises in, in terms of uh, some of the applications that you're working on or you've seen. Um, you know, who, you know, how is permissioning determined? Who gets to read it? Who gets to write to the blockchain? I mean, how does that uh, how does that work? Uh, well, I mean, it's interesting. The blockchain, in a sense, is the most anonymous thing out there, but in another sense, it's all open and public. So you can see everything that happens on there, but what you can't see is who did it. Um, but that, that follows, our, that, that follows in, uh, our regulatory system that we've had for several years uh, in energy trading. You know, um, trades... The number of trades are published, they're readily, you know, it's readily available information. The price that trades are done at uh, in, in aggregate is readily available information. Uh, the U.S. government push, publishes that through the EIA. 
uh, delayed so much is basically worthless. But there are other publications that publish it in closer to real time. And, um, you know, we defined 20 years ago or so, we redefined that, that said if you lie to one of those publications, that's actually market manipulation, you go to jail for it. Uh, first time I could think of that lying to a reporter became illegal, but um, <laughs> politicians didn't apply that to themselves, obviously. But um, information is the most valuable commodity out there. Um, and, you know, back up to what she was saying about shipper must have title stuff, you know, one of the corollaries of that rule is the people that own the pipeline can't have title to anything in it in a, on an interstate pipeline. Why? Because they have too much information. They know who's selling to who, how much, and where it's going. Because you have to tell them so they can ship it for you. So by law, they can't own anything in there. They can only own the pipe. Which is another regulation. Absolutely. That's a nail to your hammer. Uh, 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 <laughs> That's sir, a great line. <laughs> uh, one last question that might tie in actually several threads that have come up here. And uh, I'll start it with a little anecdote. You mentioned ICE, uh, you know, sort of ICE confirmation, ICE confirmations. Uh, you also mentioned uh, lying about price reporting. And so uh, I was speaking to a guy who used to be a lawyer at BP. Now he's a lawyer at one of the major commodity trading firms. And I think it was in uh, 2013. <laughs> Uh, European Commission uh, raided a bunch of trading shops in Europe over allegedly uh, uh, price reporting violations. And uh, the EC really had no expertise, the antitrust people really had no expertise uh, in commodity trading. And so they literally put up a, um, a, a, a sign up list. Anybody who wants to raid an energy company today, sign up here. <laughs> and so a bunch of people that didn't know anything sign up and they're assigned. And the, uh, and they go in, and uh, the guy that uh, went into the BP guy, you know, tells the trader to get out of his chair. I'm going to look at your computer, and you know, the lawyer is standing over his shoulder, monitoring him, and the guy's going through this stuff. And and the uh, the the guy from the EC says, uh, uh, "You trade a lot of ice, yeah? Frozen water, really?" So uh, <laughs> the question that I want to close with is: Is that our regulators going to be up to speed to handling? the technological transformation that blockchain might bring? Short answer. So I, I, I'm getting the, the cue that this is the lightning round. So. <laughs> I, I think they're trying. I, I, I think they're a couple of years away before they have um, some sort of a framework or even a proposed framework to, to regulate this. I don't want to be mean, mm -hmm. so I'm not answering. <laughs> That's enough. <laughs> Taking the fifth, OK. Uh, I, I, I will say no. Uh, the regulators are always a little behind. Uh, they're constantly playing catch up. Uh, that's just the structure. Uh, they, they are reactionary, not proactive. Um, however, I will say this, that as uh, on, the, on the state level, they seem to be a little bit ahead and, and have a slightly better understanding than at the federal national level. And that also is not unusual. But uh, we have seen much better understanding among state regulatory agencies than we have among the federal. Well, uh, on that happy note, uh, I guess uh, we're going to close the session. I guess that's also uh, pretty much uh, the end of the day. So please give uh, the panelists a round of applause.